Are you ready to become awesomer? Hello everyone, this is Umar Hamid, your host, and welcome to the No Limit Selling Podcast, where industry leaders share their tips, strategies, and advice on how to make you better, stronger, faster. Get ready for another episode. Today, I have the privilege of having Tony Shuto here with me today. Tony, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's great to be here. Tony, I want you to take me, we're going to go kind of mid-career, 1981, you get off the plane in Japan. What was that like? Oh, my God. Well, it was a long flight there. Yes. The longest flight I've ever taken. I've been to taken. Tokyo. It's a long flight. <laughs> in my life. I was only well, 20, maybe 28 by that time. Did you travel with the band or were you Yeah, gonna... the whole band went at the same time. And um, it was amazing getting off the plane at Narita Airport, um, riding through the city. It was like Times Square, but you couldn't read the any signs. of the signs. <laughs> it was red and blue and yellow. So it was like Times white. Square on LSD. Yes. And all the, um, the pagoda buildings, you know, it's just amazing. It was like an unreal when was your first show and where was it? The first show, uh, we did three shows in Tokyo to start it off, and they were at uh, the Yamayuri Hall, mm -hmm. which it, it wasn't a really, it wasn't um, Budokan, because my single had first come out, my album was very popular over there, had a top ten, top five single, top ten album. Nice. So I was a new artist, and um, so they put me in a, maybe a 3,000 seater to start That's off That's big. And uh, we filled it, and uh, the Japanese girls were crazy. They were rushing uh, the limousines and throwing roses at me. It was much like all the Beatles stuff. That's what came to mind as soon as you said that. That's what it sounded like. Yeah, and it was co so cool for me to experience that under the power of my music. The fact that the music that I created with my head got me on a plane, pushed me over there to another side of the world. And it moved people. And it moved people that couldn't even speak my language. What's interesting is uh, I see the Japanese as the polar opposite to Americans. I've done a presentation there. It was like the worst presentation ever because all the businessmen in the room, they show no emotion. Yes. And right. so we like transmit emotion all the time. Right. But the only thing that's different is when it's rock and roll music especially Japanese girls, mm -hmm. emote. Yeah. So that was the height of your career at that point? Yes. Um, as me being a solo artist, Tony Shuto, the record did very well over there because um, Epic Sony mm -hmm. bought the master and marketed it totally different than the United States. Put a different single out, um, you know, and... It was very, very popular, but the United States did not do the same single, did not do any marketing at all. Yeah, it's uh, kind of, especially now, and maybe back then, uh, I'm more familiar with books. And this is an amazing book, if you ever get a chance. Uh, That's my book now. <laughs> is that uh, they rely on you, publishers rely on you, the artist, the author, to do all the marketing. Bring They'll it to the table. You They'll give you a check, like, thank you for writing mm -hmm. this book, here's a retainer, but they expect you to spend every single dime of that on publicists and promotion. Yes. And uh, so take me back to Japan, because you're about to open in this market that's really hot for you. Right. So what's that like mentally? Like, is there pressure there? Is there relief there? Like, what were you feeling? Well, you were mentioning earlier about... Um life-changing experience and uh, I was scared shitless because I, I'm a pretty um, laid-back guy yes and um, I'm, I'm not an in-your-face like hey check me out type of guy and my manager told me he says look you I want you to wear cowboy boots and I want you because of Western you know right uh, opposed to Eastern I want you to jump into the audience you know and uh, Man, that was like something that I could... Like when they were holding you or just go in and start walking? No, I just them? jumped over the... Um, I ju off the stage into right. the audience and started playing guitar as long as my cord. Oh, that was that's amazing. Because I was wireless. Yeah. You know? 
or there might have been wireless back then, but we didn't have it. Uh, and uh, I mean, I remember the night before I could barely sleep because I was thinking about, you know, that's what they wanted me to do. Uh, but once I did that, I felt like I jumped into an ocean not knowing the depth, but I survived it. You know what's kind of interesting is you're up on the stage, the audience is down below. By just doing that one simple act, you connect with yes. them in a more personal level. Oh, yeah. So how did that change your career or your thinking about your music when you had that kind of reaction? It, I, more than that, it changed my life. Uh, I, 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 I delve into things quicker now not anticipating failure right because most a lot of people go well maybe i shouldn't do that because this could happen or that could happen um i just kind of size it up and go you know what if i could do this i'm going to just go for it and do it and sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes it does and when it, but i'm a i'm gonna go i'm gonna go get her i'll go for her. i go for it and even if it doesn't work it is uh Next feedback experience. It's experience, it's feedback, what can I do better? Even if yes. it works really well, yeah. there's also lessons there yeah. to improve. Uh, today, just earlier today at 10 o'clock, I had a meeting with this prospective client, and he'd heard me speak, we had a conversation, he came on as a client, mm -hmm. then it just so happens today that uh, my wife passed uh, a year ago today. Oh, I'm sorry. And I revealed that to him, just matter-of-factly, but kind of a lot of emotion came up when I did it, I didn't realize. But something interesting that happened, uh, he trusted me enough to hire me to help him. But as soon as I revealed that, he revealed that the name of his company is, because his parents had passed away, is 3G Leadership. And G's the last name, or the letter that represents it. And he shared that story. Yeah. And in that two-minute interchange, we bonded like brothers. Connection. So when you reveal yourself, yeah, yeah, yeah. most people think, it's a weakness, but no, it's the ultimate strength is being yourself. Yeah, And if absolutely. you step into that, even when you're doing music, yeah. like when, one of the things that sucks about doing podcast people is this, is that we're going to do this podcast, we're going to have a great conversation, and then I'm going to turn off the recording equipment, and then gold comes out of that side of the, the desk, because for whatever reason, people let their guard down, and all of a sudden they, they tell me these amazing things. Mm -hmm. And we can do that for ourselves. When we reveal ourselves, the best self comes out. Right. Your thoughts? I, no, I feel that way. I'm, I'm pretty uh, open. I, I don't really, I mean, what is, is. I mean, reality is reality. And I mean, mm -hmm. you can paint it all kinds of different colors, but it is what it is. Or what Elvis said. Um, uh, don't step in my blue suede shoes. Yeah. He said that too. <laughs> The truth will always come out. It might be a cloudy day, but the sun will, will shine and show the truth. He said it in a different way, but that's what it that's meant. That's the essence, and I mean, right? Yeah, and the, so many people today hide uh, behind some kind of barrier because of weakness. Really. What's interesting is, uh, and you can probably think of a few people right now when I mention this, that you've met people that were not being truthful. Not that they were lying, but they were hiding some part of themselves yeah. and you didn't know what it was, but it just gives you this slight hinky feeling that you know something isn't right. Yeah. And why go through that? Uh, there's a scene from this movie, do you remember Crocodile Dundee? Yeah. There's this one scene where uh, his host, this publisher, is talking about a psychiatrist. And she says, what do you do back in, you know, Australia in the bush? She says, ah, oh, we tell his, his partner, this old kind of guy, people go and talk to him. She goes, oh, is he a therapist? He says, no, he's a busybody. If you tell him, everybody in the village knows. <laughs> and if they know, you don't have a problem anymore. Right. <laughs> right. So, Tony, tell me about a particular time where you were accidentally awesome. And by that, I mean, you've done a lot of performances in your career, and there could have been a time where you did this performance where you were just in the zone and you kind of look back at that evening going, you know, I wonder what happened today that I was just my very best self. Have you had one of those where... I, I have those nights. I've had one of those nights all through my career and they have one common thread. What's that? Full moon. Really? Oh, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And I... I I equate it to, they say that uh, if the, um, the moon can move the ocean, we're 75% water. Liquid, you know, so um, I would. Uh, my That's wife. the missus. You got to look after her. <laughs> yeah. But, so uh, here is, uh, 
So I've only seen you perform once. Okay. It was at Zen West. Right. And a friend of mine, Jimmy Wilson, yes. and uh, uh, Lee Kramer, she had interviewed you in Ocean City. Yes, yes. And A, you remembered right away. Yes, yes. But the thing, the reason I wanted to sit down with you was this, is that two things. One, you said that, you know, you were super big in Japan. And I wanted to know what that felt like being uh, a hero in a foreign land. Because Jimmy Wilson is super big in Germany. Uh-huh. Where people are lining up for an autograph, wow. and but not in his homeland as much, and uh, so a uh, that and b when you went from just being Tony Shudo and all of a sudden uh, uh, being really popular, what was that transition like mentally? So we talked about the Japan thing. What was that transition like for you when you went from trying really hard to uh, making it? Well, it, it was making it in a sense. I mean, when I was a little boy. Um, even before I saw my first rock band, which were the Beatles, right. uh, that blew my mind. But uh, I was listening to the radio, and the radio caught my ear. Um, and my older brother would buy um, 45s. Right. Today, 45s are guns, but back in my day, they were records. And um, I'd always look at it turning around. I said, I, I want to put my name on one of those one day. Right. And I, I accomplished that. So Not, when, when did you have that thought, I'm going to put my name on that one day? I may have been 1962, 1961. And you were how old then? I was, excuse me? How old were you then, oh, 1962? Uh, nine. Okay. So I'm going to take you through a little uh, thing, if I may. Sure. So, Tony, take a deep breath in for a moment. Hold it for about three seconds. Let it out slowly. And for a moment, just close your eyes, and I want you to go back to that moment in time where your brother had that 45 and see whatever you saw back then. It could have been the 45, could have been him. James as best Brown. As, yeah, as best as you can, go back to that moment and hear whatever you heard, his conversation, your thoughts, and looking at that 45. And when you go back to that moment, seeing what you saw back then and hearing what you heard back then, you get to re-experience what you were feeling. Right. What were you feeling and where in your body do you feel it now? Um, it was the awesomeness of the sound. Yeah. And it, how the sound moved me. Uh, when I was a baby, my mom told me she would take me to, like, cookouts and where there were bands. Like, yes. And whenever I heard uh, trumpets, I would she cry. Per- cried. I, I would cry. Interesting. Because it, music moved me um, so I was very delicate. Right. So she knew that when I was a little boy that music was, I was very affected by music. So when I saw that 45 spinning around, heard that music, it, it woke something up in me that made me, hey, I want to do, that's what I want to do. You know, you know what's kind of interesting is I love nurses when they're hot. But no, <laughs> did you know it's the most trusted profession in the U.S.? More than doctors by far. But when I talk to nurses, they'll tell me about a time that I was six years old and my dad had an episode. He got rushed to the hospitals. And when I saw nurses doing what they did, I knew that I'm going to be a nurse. So it sounds like a very similar thing. Yeah. When you saw that, it was one of those life-changing kind of, this is going to happen kind of things. Yeah. So how did that change your outlook on life at that point? Well, it, it did in a sense. I tell you, um, academically, because... Uh, Okay, I'll tell you a story. Um, I fell in love with uh, this one band, uh, The Four Seasons, when I was a little boy. Yep. And I lived right, like, a couple miles from TV Hill. And they were going to be on the Buddy Dean Show, which is right down the street from my house. And I was in school, and I must have done something bad because I had to stay after school. And they were going to be on the show at a certain time. And you were going to miss it? And I was going to miss it. I ran down the hill. I skinned my arm. I was bleeding. But I got in front of that TV bl- with blood going down my arm, and I watched that show. It changed my life academically because, you know, when I got into high school, um, I was working in retail selling mod clothing. Mm-hmm. I was in a band making 200 bucks a week, making 150 with uh, retail, $350 a week I'm making. I'm in a polytechnic school, and I have the, um, the uh, principal say, you got to cut your hair or else you're kicked out of school. So bring your mother into school. So my mom came to school and, and 
the principal goes, oh, your son looks like a girl. He's got to get his hair cut. And she goes, well, <laughs> go to hell. He's keeping his hair like that. So that's how it changed. The, nice. It changed me because I knew from being a little kid what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So what's interesting is every single human being on planet Earth has a purpose in life. The only problem is 98% of people never figure it out. And one of the ways you know that is how many people do you know in their 40s and 50s that end up in a life going, this is not what I signed up for. And you had the blessing of uncovering your purpose and quite literally you bled for it going there. And it just gives you focus and power to achieve, right? Well, that's the right word, blessing, because I, I, I feel like I feel like I'm chosen. I mean, a lot of times when I write music and I hear it back and I go, where did that come from? I don't remember. I mean, I remember, but it's like, wow, what a gift. So it almost transcends the physical plane when you're doing stuff like that, where yeah. it's like, oh, where did that come from? Yeah. How did I channel this particular yeah. gem? So right now, uh, you're not at the height of your fame. No. So what was that transition like when you went from, you know, uh, adoring fans and it's like a career to stepping out of it? What was that transition like? It was depressing. Um, you know, the high that you get from going, I signed up for this and wow, I, I hit a home run. Um, and then I find out when I come back to my home country, we, we had a, a meeting right after our Japanese tour because you fly to L.A. After, mm-hmm. from Japan to come to the East Coast. And um, I have a meeting with the head of the record company, and I, we finally get to the record company and knock on the door, and doors close. So we think, we're thinking of worst already. But finally the door swings open, and it's Ringo Starr. <laughs> and, he go, and he looks at me and goes, I hope you have better luck than me. So obviously he, got, he was on the same label right. as me. He got fired. And uh, I didn't have better luck than him because I went in and uh, we had our meeting and said, Tony, unfortunately, the ball of wax is not in Japan. and It's in America. And you didn't sell but, you know, we wanted 20 you some to. thousand copies here. So um, I was let down. I said, but wow, the telexes sent from Japan said that we were knocking them dead with da-da-da, all that. And they said it didn't matter. So that put threw me into a depression, yeah. So here's my hypothesis. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is uh, depressing for sure. But when you know your purpose, at some point through that depression, it was making music again, I suspect, is what kept you sane. Oh, yeah. I still, to this day, am making music. It's, it's, like, it's like sweating, you know? I mean, it's something that's going to come out no matter what, you know? So purpose is a direction. If direction is west, there's no less west. You can go around the planet 150 times and still go west in different directions. And I think that's the blessing of purpose, right. is that I suspect, you know, when you're 95... And feeble-minded, you'll still be sharp when it comes to making music. Because you hear these stories of musicians that have curled up fingers and they can't do anything. But when they get before a piano, things just free up. Well, And the strength of that. I'm kind of one of those. Right. (laughs) Because, I I mean, I have ulnar neuropathy in my left arm and my hand. You can see it's shaking now. And my little finger sometimes doesn't make the exact note I want to hit. But when I'm on stage, I just blind all that out and I just my ears find the sound nice. you know, and my hands kind of put it right where my ears want to hear it and even if I have to do stuff that hurts I don't hurt until I get in bed later and when I'm laying down I feel the uh, you're in the flow at that point and it's just happening <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I think that's what I want for people watching this listening to this is that you have to find your passion and the passion isn't something stupendous out there When you uncover your purpose, everybody has one. It changes the lens on how you see the world. Right. And it allows you to, no matter what's going on, whether it's incredible fame or it's not that, you still feel happy and centered in that place. Well, just having that, having the purpose is great when you have fame, but but it's also great just to have it, period, because a lot of people don't have it. You know. Absolutely. So, Tony, do you have any children, by the way? I have two daughters, yes, grown daughters. How old? Uh, one is 39, one is 32. Any grandkids? Yes, just had one. 
Clementine. Clementine. She's the love of my life. And this is, you should write a song. No, there's a song already written about her. Uh, yeah, my yeah. darling Clementine. Yeah. So here's, I sing it to her all the time. Here's the question for you. As she grows up in this ever-changing world, so what's kind of interesting, I'm going to take a side note, I'll come back, I promise, is why the hell is Shakespeare still relevant today is because the human condition has not changed. The toys have changed, but yeah. that human connection has not. Right. So looking at your life and what you've learned, all the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, what would be three lessons that you wish you could impart to Clementine that would help her in her life? Three lessons, wow. Stay away from Umar, but other than that. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I've already made her privy to the guitar because we have one up on the wall and every time I come in, she looks at it. She's, she's not even one year old yet. But um, uh, I would just say stick as close to the truth as you possibly can all yeah. your life because there's nothing that exists other than the truth. Be kind and stay healthy. I, I don't – I mean, that's, that's three – be with the truth, I'd be kind, be healthy. Yeah, I'd Third one will come as soon as we finish up on that. <laughs> when we shut off the mic, it'll come. <laughs> Tony, what's a question I should have asked you that I didn't? Um, that's interesting. Um, well, I mean, I, I, um, the Tony Shuto aspect artist of my career was just a small part. I, was, I spent eight years on the road with the Little River Band. I was their pianist. Nice. Uh, I've written songs for Tina Turner, Don Johnson, Bay City Rollers, B.J. Thomas, and a, a lot of other artists that aren't that, as famous as that. Um, uh, the Beatles manager wanted to take me to uh, New York and groom me as a child star when I was mere 13 years old. I interesting stuff. I mean, my nice. life has been blessed with a lot of nooks and crannies that, that are wonderful. So this podcast is called No Limit Selling. What we're really talking about is human beings, because ultimately selling is that. Yeah. And uh, I think our lives and the way we see the world is a lens. And through this podcast, people get to see their lives through your lens. Right. And sometimes that gives us deep moving insights that we normally wouldn't have gotten through our own lens. Right. So Tony, thanks so much for sharing your journey. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. And if you're looking for more tools, go to my website at nolimitselling.com. I've got a free mind training course there that's going to teach you some insights from the world of neuro-linguistic programming and that is the fastest way to get better results.